Hello, I want to welcome everyone participating in today's webinar, subpart E, Cost Principles Under Uniform Guidance. This is part two of our four-part webinar series, the Indirect Rate Toolkit for Nonprofits with Federal Grants. My name is Yevgeny Suhenko, and I'm a supervisor for Outsourced Accounting and Advisory Services at GRF CPAs and Advisors, formerly known as Gelman, Rosenberg, and Friedman, and I will be today's moderator. I'd like to start off today with some quick housekeeping items and explain what you'll need to do to earn CPE credit. All participants CP seeking CPE credit today must complete and submit a short evaluation survey that will appear automatically immediately following the webinar. You will be asked to recall the words given in order to receive credit. Please write down the CPE words when they are given and keep them until you receive your certificate as they will not be provided again. If you have any technical questions or issues during the webinar, please use the questions function to speak with our webinar administrator for assistance. The slide deck and the recording from the webinar will be available for download after the webinar has concluded. You will also receive a follow-up email with direct links. Technical support and CPE questions may be addressed to Nathan McLevine at mmclvein at grfcpa.com. Today's learning objective is to provide an overview of the cost principles, subpart E, under uniform guidance. One CPE credit is available for this webinar. And with that, I'd like to introduce your presenters for the webinar today. Paul Calabrese is a principal in the firm's Outsourced Accounting and Advisory Services Group. Mr. Calabrese brings a successful track record of working with both nonprofits and government contractors. His remarkable career includes positions with the Air Force Audit Agency, DCAA, and three government contractors, in addition to 20 plus years in public accounting. Trisha Catabini is a senior manager in the firm's audit department. She has worked in public accounting for more than 12 years, specializing in serving the nonprofit sector. And with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Paul. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning. Today, we're going to talk about the selected cost principles or actually a selected group of the cost principles today. And in consideration of what we shared with two months ago, um, we talked about indirect rates under the uniform guidance. And we discussed uh, what you could and could not do under the uniform guidance. Today, we take a specific and deep dive into the selected cost principles under the uniform guidance. And we'll be sp specifically looking um, at the two most important ones, compensation and fringe benefits. But first, we're just going to show you a list of all of the cost principles under the uniform guidance. And you'll notice at the top that we've categorized them as a, allowable, unallowable UA, allowable with restrictions, AWR, and unallowable with exceptions, UWE. So allowable all the time would be like board-related costs that generally are allowable as long as they're indirect. Unallowable would be things like alcoholic beverages or entertainment. Allowable with restrictions will be like what we will be discussing shortly on compensation. And unallowable with exceptions would be like uh, public relations, usually is unallowable, but maybe a part of a grant or advertising costs. So you can see the list here going down through C. And the next slide will show you some of the other cost principles and the numbering and how we categorize them. Um, there are a couple of new cost principles too, like exchange rates and uh, proposal cost that's coming up. And yes, and we'll keep going to the very end. Um, there are normally 55 cost principles, but uh, the uniform guidance under HHS awards added two more, independent research and development and shared responsibility payments that are two things that are a little bit more specific to HHS. 
Now we'll begin to cover the most important cost principles, compensation and fringe benefits. Perfect, thanks Paul. And with that, we've reached our first polling question. And our question is, what types of organizations are required to follow the cost principles? Is it A, nonprofits, B, hospitals, C, institutes of higher education, D, state and local tribal government units, or E, all of the above? And with that, while everybody's taking a moment to answer, I wanna remind everybody that while everybody's submitting the answers, we have our first CPE word. Our first CPE word is rate. Remember, if you wanna receive CPE credit, please jot the words down because you will need them for the survey following our webinar. Again, the first CPE word is rate, R-A-T-E. Excellent. Everybody knew that nonprofits, hospitals, institutes of higher education, state and local tribal units and governments, all of them are required to follow the cost principles under the uniform guidance. Very good, audience. So let's get into compensation. Just as a note of reminder to you and to look forward, later we will talk about the impact of the COVID virus and its impact on compensation and other cost principles in just a short few minutes. But first, we're going to talk in general about compensation and how it relates to um, the federal awards. And basically, compensation um, is based as they would expect on some kind of salary survey. How, how did you come up with that compensation? If you're very small, the auditors may just look and check your rates against what you have in the file and against the payroll register. But as an organization gets larger, they may want to look at your uh, compensation system and see whether you have a matrix. How often do you update that matrix? With a compensation matrix, do you um, escalate or increase due to cost of living increases? And what you as an organization may feel is a reasonable increase to your compensation matrix of all your personnel from year to year. Um, we could say today that interest is pretty much flat especially with the treasury rate given the issues of COVID-19. However, I would still make the statement in your compensation policy if you write it in the policy that you may give it a 3% increase from year to year and you may say, well, gee, you know, that doesn't relate to Department of Labor, CPIU, Urban Index. But you can also say, you know what? My employees, when they go and they go to the supermarket, the rates, the cost of living still goes up. The cost of products that they are purchasing, milk, eggs, whatever they may purchase, we still notice that even though so-called inflation is, is level, um, the cost of the purchases have gone up. And so you may say something that's unique in your policy as to why you feel, as an example, compensation may go up from year to year, as long as it's in, as you can see there, a written policy. This is something that I've encouraged some of the firms that I deal with, um, that you should still have an increase from year to year, even though there may be. Yes, go ahead. I would say that's, that's, that's also really, really important too, not only from the uniform guidance perspective, but also from the IRS Form 990. Uh, as we all know, there is that uh, in part six, light item, I believe 15 A and B that goes over what your compensation is for your uh, executive, as well as for your other uh, top employees within the organization. So having that written policy and how it is applied and how uh, the salaries are documented and how they are uh, come up with as far as whether you're doing a survey, as you previously mentioned, is imperative not only for the cost principles here in uniform guidance, but in other aspects from a uh, compliance standpoint within the not-for-profit world. Great. And also another thing that supports this, though we know not covering it today, is just the rules on timekeeping. There are specific rules on timekeeping. It's called the standards of documentation of personal expenses. And you may wanna look at that under 200.430-I. It may be a little bit different um, for the HHS award numbering. Okay. 
consistency is something that is just the word of all of accounting, internal controls, and certainly under the uniform guidance. Because when the uniform guidance was uh, updated and put together from the old OMB circulars, one of the main things uh, under internal controls. And so one of the important internal controls is consistency in how you develop the compensation and, of course, reasonableness of what a prudent person would do in the conduct of competitive business. With all those factors considered, they would expect that as you hire and bring on people, if you have a compensation matrix, that there's a parity there. There's You're hiring people that are in similar positions and similar salaries. Um, a competitive business will do that. Um, sometimes the people you may bring on may be very unique. You may be bringing on a very specialized individual, and therefore you may have to go out into the marketplace, do some benchmarking and other things so that you can determine the appropriate salary or, again, a compensation survey. There is a general principle that costs that are unallowable under another cost principle would also be unallowable under this cost principle. So if for some other reason uh, something was made disallowed, uh, that would also be disallowed here. The National Institute of Health and Administration of Child, Children and Families, ACF is generally deals with Head Start. They do have compensation limits on salaries. And so you should be made aware of it. And I'm sure you are if you're working on those specific awards as they may impact. Um, and then if you get a new award or a lot of awards, the government's still going to look at, you know, are you increasing your salaries because you're getting a lot of cost reimbursable grant awards or cooperative agreement awards? They will look at it. So hopefully, again, consistency uh, would follow the day. For incentive compensation, a lot of organizations may have something about it in their manuals, they may not. It's not a bad idea to have something in there. Uh, a lot of employers are concerned that they don't want to be forced into a formula unless there was a unique commission situation, which would be on a formula. But in most situations, incentive compensation or bonuses aren't. But there may be a practice that you follow from year to year so consistently implied uh, to uh, that it implies a practice. For example, you may in December, if you're on a 1231 year end, you may, you know, in November or December, you know, sit down with, with management and say, okay, these certain individuals qualify for an, an incentive or a bonus according to our plan. And, um, and then in January, or February, they're dispersed. Um, and therefore, it's done that way every year, and you go through that same process, and maybe at different times of the year, then that would be considered a consistent practice. But again, remember, because we have uh, the help of Trish, who is an auditor, the more you write down as policies and procedures, the better. Regarding fringe benefits, um, most fringe benefits are permitted. Um, there are specifics about certain limitations on certain fringe benefits, but the ones, especially the statutory ones, payroll taxes, you know, um, state unemployment, federal unemployment, if it applies, um, workers' compensation, all of those things, um, and unemployment insurance, all of those, of course, would be allowed because they're statutory. Um, and then there's other things that you may have. You may have short-term, long-term disabilities. You may even have things where you provide Metro uh, or Metro passes for individuals. And um, all those are appropriate. Um, so it's just a matter of having a documented policy. Often people put this in their employee manual. And as a startup, most of the, the first uh, procedure that you often see is an employee manual is is the bedrock because most nonprofits most of their costs um, is labor and related fringe um, so and as far as allocation um, well we'll talk about that in the next couple of slides fringe benefits for most nonprofits um, their paid absence is often a part of what we call the wage line the labor 
is uh, you have a labor line and benefit and the paid absence is a part of that, which is perfectly fine. There are a few nonprofits that are similar to government contracts as far as allocating costs, and they put their paid absence actually in the fringe cost pool or the numerator. Um, either one, I've seen pretty much all of the agency templates and all of the agency templates permit it. So either one is acceptable. Um, Vacation. Um, if your vacation was uh, and you're on a cash basis accounting, then vacation is really just recognized in the time that it's provided, just like holiday and if sick, paid absence. Those are all recognized when paid or when it actually happens. Accrued vacation is a little bit different. Accrued is going to be accrued no matter what. It's going to be accrued every pay period and per gap. Um, you know, when you leave, you're going to get a disbursement um, of your unused um, vacation that you've accrued and, and accumulated per your policy. In case there's, unless there's a limitation that says you can't carry more than, let's say, 100, what is it, 144 hours or something like that each year or so many days. Um, so that that is understandable, but um, basically, again, accrued vacation is, and especially when people estimate. Accrued vacation is going to happen every every pay period, but paid absences that are based on an, uh, an action or event like holiday or jury duty or something else, you know, you won't get recovery unless that happens. Key person insurance is something where um, agencies, um, organizations, they want to insure on their key people. There's such a rainmaker, such important organization, the organization receives the benefit and therefore it is unallowable cost. If it's the families receive it, that's something entirely different and it's allowable for life insurance. Um, but for this, key man insurance is unallowable. Uh, the use of personal autos are unallowable, anything for personal use and whether or not um, it shows up on a W-2, doesn't matter, it's still unallowable. So think of there are three different kinds of concepts here, assignment of cost allowable in a particular period of time. Measurement deals with how is it that item uh, measured in terms of consistency or cost policy and allocation, allocating the cost um, as an indirect or internal allocation. Severance pay is allowable. If you're using it and tracking it and developing reserves for that, accruing it and putting it aside, that's fine. The government doesn't really have a problem so long as, again, we always go back to what is reasonable. What is your industry standard? Again, what is your documented policy, as Trish had mentioned? Um, so that's not a problem. You may have different levels, you know, a key executive. A key executive may, um, have a couple of months or many months, maybe up to half a year, whereas uh, individuals that are not at that level may only have uh, a couple of weeks or a month. The more you document, the more it's going to be supported in, or a you can show historically this is what we've done and so to imply a practice, um, that is also um, acceptable. But two things of note that are unallowable or keep um, um, we say golden parachutes, which we'll talk about in a minute, and mass severance. And that's just generally where perhaps you're focus, you're operating more like a government contractor. You hire a bunch of people related to an award. Maybe you have people going out and they're they're taking a census of type of a certain type for your organization to gather information. You need them in the summer, but after the summer you don't need them. And then the decision whether to give them a severance or not. If you are going to give someone a severance like that, like it was on the last slide, which we don't have to turn back to, you will notice there there's something called a prior written agreement um, or prior approved cost. If you want to go and get that approved up front, the best way to do it in the, the method would be through your budget. When you put together an application um, and to a grant application, the best place to put in things that you feel are unique, you can do a prior written agreement, 
um, with your grants officer. But as we know, grants officers always are very hard to get. It's not a put down on them. They just very, the government doesn't have tremendous resources either. And they're limited grants management officers and the time that they have to deal with everybody. So the best way to do it is to be proactive because everybody, when they review your grant application at an agency like Department of Justice, I'm quite aware I used to work with them a little bit in their training and they scrutinize all the grant budgets. So um, when they come in, if you have something that's unique, put it in your budget narrative and put the dollar amount in your budget. And if it's been approved, then it's been approved. And so if you had like here, you'll notice at the bottom there, um, for example, we may need more people, especially in a third world nation, if you're doing overseas work and you need to hire TCN's third world, um, third country nationals, and you hire the third country nationals to ramp up, but then you need some when you ramp down. Generally, that may, for severance for them, may be unallowable, but if it's written in your budget and it is approved, that is another way to support that cost. But golden parachutes, especially like your reorganization or the organization has merged with someone else and there's a change of ownership or control, those costs are unallowable. So we came to a slide here um, that really want, we wanted to talk a little bit about some updates as it relates to COVID-19 and what has been occurring the past month here. Um, before I get into that though, I really wanted to touch a little bit on some of the things that Paul was talking about from an auditor's perspective. And one of those items really relates to the supporting documentation for timekeeping as it relates to uh, compensation. One of the big things that, as we all know, came about as a part of uniform guidance uh, when it became effective back on December 26, 2014, was that the documentation for the timekeeping became a little bit more enhanced and there was a lot more um, emphasis now, obviously, on internal controls. So uh, a lot of the organizations when uniform guidance kind of came into place back in their 2015 audits, fiscal year 2015 audits for most of them, uh, didn't really have the implementation for timesheets and for time tracking. One of the exceptions here obviously is that if you have an employee specifically who is um, working on an award 100% of their time and it's clearly written that way from their job description standpoint, obviously we know that that is a, a direct charge to the award. Um, but timekeeping is, is of great emphasis here. So uh, making sure that you have uh, a tracking that is clear over where people's time are spent so then when you do come up with your indirect rate, you have that clear pool of what can be included within those indirects based on what has been directly charged versus what can be included in that allocation. So just uh, wanting to make sure that that is also clear from an auditor standpoint. Now moving on to COVID-19. Some of the updates that came out of here, we do have on our blog, on our grfcpa.com website, if you go under resources on our blog, we do have uh, a, an article or a white paper written up about this, but back on March 20th, or March 19th, I'm sorry, uh, OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, did offer or extend out another memorandum. It's M-20-17, which you see on your screen here. That has some relief that's been extended for those who have federal grants. Now within that memorandum, there are several points here. I think there are about 13 in total, um, but points six and seven are two that really we wanted to talk about here within our update. Number six relates to salaries. So uh, the awarding agencies are allowed to um, have those federal pass-through entities be able to continue to charge salaries and benefits on currently active federal awards, um, whether people are working or not, as long as the organization has a policy that is written under what they call expect, unexpected or extraordinary circumstances. Now, I've had a lot of questions emailed to me um, over the recent weeks since this has been issued over what does that policy look like? What should be included? What types of employees should be covered? So uh, some of the interpretation from this, I think from some of the organizations out there is that, well, this really only applies to my employees who are actually federally funded. So those, those employees out there who are charged directly to the grant. 
from an auditor standpoint, and Paul, I believe you're on the same uh, probably um, rationale and thought process as I am on this, but really it should apply to all employees, whether they are funded through federal grants, private grants through foundations or other corporations, or whether they're just funded by ongoing operations within the organization. Because again, as we all know, uniform guidance really means that items uh, and principles that are under this should be uniformly applied. So from our perspective, that really means that this kind of a policy should encompass all of our, all of the employees under the organization's umbrella. So what is unexpected or extraordinary circumstances? This is where we're getting into a lot of organizations. I don't want to say are scrambling to get a policy into place, but uh, a, a lot of organizations simply just did not have uh, a pandemic response or a crisis response kind of a policy written into their into their actual guidelines and, and procedures. So I urge you, if you have not yet done that and you are in this circumstance where you are charging your federal dollars, uh, I'm sorry, federal grants for compensation for employees who may not be working currently because of the pandemic, get a policy written into place. Um, I would also urge you to reach out to your awarding agency to make sure that this is covered uh, and from their standpoint as well and making sure that they're also in um, kind of in in line with the same policy that you've written and as you've written it. One of the other big questions out there uh, related to compensation now too, as we all know, is the Paycheck Protection Program loans. So many of the organizations that we work fall within the realm of being able to apply for this loan. So the PPP loan um, is available and out there for organizations with less than 500 employees. So many of my uh, clients that are, are currently um, under the 500 employee threshold have already applied for and have been working with their awarding agencies um, and saying, well, what happens in an instance where we do get approach, approved for this loan? It covers two months or eight weeks of my payroll, but I'm still charging federal dollars for some of that compensation. So from my standpoint, and Paul and I were talking a little bit about this beforehand, but from an auditor standpoint, if you are continuing to charge your grants, your federal grants for salaries, but then you're also going to be getting this Paycheck Protection Program loan, which as we all know, ultimately can be forgiven in whole or in part. It's almost like we're double dipping, right? So we're charging the federal grant, getting money back from the federal government as a reimbursement basis. And then on the other hand, we're also getting what I would quote unquote call free dollars from the federal government through the PPP loan. So one of the things that we were kind of talking through, and again, these are all unanswered questions at this point in time. So this is clearly um, not what I would call state expert guidance or advice, but something, again, we've just been talking through at this point of what means, um, is that it, at a time when, um, and Paul, you can kind of jump in here if you think so, uh, if, you, if you feel so free to, um, but at a time and a point where you do ultimately get approved for that loan and you know what your dollar amount is, then we were talking through perhaps working through with your awarding agencies or your auditors and understanding what that kind of a consequence might mean for what you have also charged into your federal grant. Does that mean that you adjust it? Do you draw it back? Or is there some other kind of adjustment at the end of the period or the award? So again, unanswered questions, but these are all things that obviously we as auditors are dealing with. Paul as a consultant is dealing with, and then you as organizations are also dealing with. We've got a lot of people working on the backside for it. I know the American Institute of CPAs is working on some technical guidance. Um, I know the Small Business Administration, I don't even think they still have some of the answers, even though they're the ones that are kind of administering this program along with the Federal Reserve. So again, kind of just things to think through as an organization and what you should be kind of thinking about as you go through this process through COVID-19. Paul, I don't know if you have anything else to add on that point before I go into the other. Um, sure. Um, well, we discussed earlier the possibility that, um, well, it has to do with like you were talking about the Department of Justice. Do you want to talk about what they permit? Right, and so I did have a client specifically um, reach out who is working and has a grant with the Department of Justice who 
their grants officer is actually advising them to charge both the federal grant, even though they are ultimately going to be uh, getting the PPP loan and are relying on that forgiveness. So even though they are optimistic about the forgiveness, DOJ is sitting there saying, go ahead and continue to charge that grant and charge those salaries to your funds. But again, I don't know what that consequence means. That may just, again, be during this current time where they don't have the loan. So what does that mean after the loan has been secured? Yeah, and the concern is, is that if people, as the government under this um, emergency relief guidance is providing with respect to the uniform guidance that you can charge for people um, that would stay home and maybe not even work, but are charged to a federal ward, the concern is, is that you are using up grant funds. And as Trish uh, will explain in a minute, is no guarantee that the government will give you additional funds, which means then you're going to have to make a decision. You know, do we use the grant funds to help us keep going because we're very small as an entity and we have to survive and, you know, and we'll deal with the other issues on another day because a lot of things haven't been defined or we're very, very large, like an AARP type of entity where we would just uh, not charge the award because we need to complete the award. Exactly. So as uh, Paul kind of foreshadowed there, there is another um, relief point within this memorandum about uh, allowability of costs that aren't normally chargeable to awards. So for instance, cancellation fees um, typically would not have been allowable to an award, but under COVID-19, if you have incurred costs that are related to cancellation of events, travel that's related to it, or other kind of um, necessary activities or, you know, items that are reasonable for the performance of that specific award. Uh, again, these are now going to be allowable, again, up to the awarding agency. So I always advise reaching out to your grants officer or whomever you um, are speaking with from a representative standpoint from your awarding agencies to ensure that they are, um, again, also uh, under the impression that this is something that they would allow making sure that um, you have done that due diligence. So you have to maintain all appropriate records and cost documentations, just like you typically would under all of that. But as Paula had already mentioned, this may or um, may not be, be uh, fully funded. So Paul, I, I think you had mentioned a little bit, or we were talking a little bit about um, what that might also mean for the award itself. So do you want to talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah, I mean, um, there's a decision making process here. So again, consider if the ward funds are being used up, which will you decide to do? Will you decide because we need to use this money now to keep ourselves, it's part of our keeping our entity alive because we're very small and we need this resource? Or are we in a situation where we just we will not use these funds because there is a consideration that the government said there's no guarantee that additional funds will be provided, and thus if provisional funds aren't being provided and the government sees, you know, they're going to know. Like for example, um, in Department of Education, they have something called G5, and the Department of Education people are going to look into G5 and they're going to say, okay, these people were permitted to spend money and keep going. But we know from their performance reports that they really, it was all spent for the last month or so on COVID stuff. And now we know that, you know, they've used 90% of the award, but really programmatically, they only did, let's say 25% as an example. Then the agency has got to decide, well, this is a very important program. We're gonna to have to find funds or because of everything going weird under COVID-19 uh, virus, um, there are no more funds and we'll have to go back and tell them that we're going to terminate for convenience because there's no more funds. Right. So one of the other things that I just want to mention in closing about this memorandum before we move on to the next part of our presentation is that this was issued on uh, March 19th of 2020. 
OMB is going to be reassessing this in 90 days from the date of that memorandum. So again, this does come with a time limitation. So if you haven't been looking at this yet and you believe that it does impact you, um, I would do so uh, as soon as you can. So now we're going to go to the everyday cost principles. So, so far, we have focused on compensation and fringe benefits, which again is the lion's share of costs, except for generally rent, I suppose, for most nonprofits. We're in the service world, we're in the service, we're going to provide reports and other things that we just don't provide widgets like a manufacturing. So, there are other though types of costs that I would say that a nonprofit will deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. The many selected cost principles today, we, because of shortness of time, uh, we're only going to go over the ones we feel you need to deal with on a day-by-day -day basis. And of course, one of the first ones is advisory councils or boards of director, which are generally allowable as long as they're an indirect cost. Alcoholic beverages, we know, are unallowable. There are a lot of issues, though, in kind of tracking that, um, especially for newer organizations or often what happens in association, which is a little bit different, 501c6. Um, they get in with a one federal ward or something like that, and they have management, and management uh, in many ways deals like a private entity. And they have uh, special dinners, special ways of outreach, and alcoholic beverages are used. And so it becomes a challenge for them, you know, because they're not normally in the federal grant world or cooperative agreement world and how to track those kinds of costs. And uh, so that's something for them to consider. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll just say, under the meals and the travel, because it's all mixed in, we just voluntarily delete all of that because it's not worth the time to go find if, you know, all the alcoholic beverages on the receipts. Great, thanks, Paul. So we're now on our second polling question, and our question is, entities that have federal awards less than the audit threshold of $750,000 that want to have an audit are permitted to recover the cost of those program-specific audits. Is it A for true or B for false? So please take a moment to answer. While everybody's recording their answers, I'll provide the second CPE word. Our second CPE word is goods. If you wanna receive CPE credit, remember to jot these words down because you will need them for the survey following our webinar. Again, the second CPE word is goods, G-O-O-D-S. Ah, so this is an interesting answer here. So let's go on to the next slide and we will get you your answer. Unfortunately, you're not allowed to recover costs for uh, audits, single audits, if, if your threshold, if you're below the threshold of $750,000. Also, if the single audit or program specific audit was not performed in accordance with subpart F of the uniform guidance. So it's something to take into consideration. And if should an agency ask you to do it, uh, you know, you might want to ask them, well, we'd like to have specific a waiver or approval and the money for it in our budget. And or another possible thing I could see happening is where a prime, maybe not a pass through entity, maybe not fully informed, requires you to do it, even though you're less than 750,000, and you may have to push back. Trish, you wanted to talk about invoicing on this and breaking out the cost. Right. Um, so one of the things that you know we as auditors uh, we typically do is when we submit our invoices for payment for audits, we typically say something or for um, professional services rendered for the financial statement audit for the year ended December 31st, 2019 in the amount of XYZ um, for whatever month it may be for. So one of the things that um, I urge you to do as an organization if you haven't already done so, as we all know, 
as Paul mentioned, if you do have a requirement for a single audit and you have included it in your budget, then that amount is an allowable cost under the cost principles. So as a part of the audit engagement, sometimes we know that we have a fixed fee, um, but sometimes it can also be an estimate, right? So we may have an estimate that it's going to be um, $10,000 for the financial statement audit and $12,000 for the single audit, depending. But again, it's an estimate. So the final cost of the actual audit may end up being more than what that, say, $22,000 totality may be. Now, if you're in a place where you do have an actual fixed fee engagement and it's $22,000, that's exactly what you're charged, your engagement letter should be able to support that $12,000 that you're charging out to your single audit. But again, if it's not, um, a fixed fee and an actual amount and it's an estimate or it's a range, um, I would urge you to work with your auditors to ensure that they have broken out the part of the invoice that is specifically related to the uniform guidance audit. Um, so that's one of the things that I know we have several requests from some of our clients that we do. Um, we attempt to try to do that anyway, just from a courtesy standpoint for our clients regardless. But again, that really helps to substantiate and validate um, how much is actually being spent and being uh, applied to that federal grant. Great. Well, the government, if you have, wants to know if you have made and uh, collected, let's say, uh, money that you shouldn't have had, and it may not be deliberate. It may be there's some reason that uh, extra money was, maybe it's a duplicate payment, or um, it maybe was a payment to an ineligible party or ineligible goods and services maybe that you felt or you, de you determined at a later point in time, something where um, you should have taken a discount, but you didn't, um, or you did take a discount and the credit should have been applied. In those kinds of situations, if you under believe after doing your analysis that um, the money should be returned to the government, um, any cost to do that would be allowable if, let's say, you had to do some research or something of that nature. So this is a new cost principle. Obviously, the government needs to have all the money that it needs as well to operate. And if you find that there's excesses, then you would want to get that back to them. In some situations, you might want to say how. And if it's not related to a specific award, you and you're still fortunately having the period of performance, you're in the middle of the period of performance, then it would just be an offset to the next uh, draw. And of course you would want to document. You would want to document all draws and all the backup to those draws. You would also like using as an example, G5 in the US Department of, of Education. You would want to there, I know you can go in and make a copy or a picture of, um, of that funds before and afterwards and so you would want to put all of that in a package and if there is any offsets you definitely want to track it so if your auditors uh question you later you have that information conferences conferences are allowable um, the cost of having those conferences for the purpose of dissemination of technical information are allowable and you can see the different types and of course if it's something that's of a direct nature then that's been prior approved or indirect. One of the big issues that have come up, and as people have probably noticed, is the whole issue of food and whether you can recover food or the cost of meals. Um, it is allowable under the federal rules, uh, under the uniform guidance. However, many agencies, I know like Department of Justice or HRSA with Ryan White, uh, the payer of last resort, they do discourage um, and will not recover allow you to recover the cost of meals when you're training people. Um, NSF has an interesting policy that dependent care is allowable uh, relating to conferences. Contributions and donations, none of it is allowable, none of it's recovered as either a direct or indirect. Um, in the Uniform Guidance 200.306 is the valuation, so you can go under that. Um, certain um, uh, donations treated as an indirect cost uh, must be separated from the indirect cost rate as unallowable. Depreciation, of course, is allowable. It's generally charged as an indirect cost. Um, 
and it's based on the you know it's based on how you came up with the fair market value and how you depreciated a lot of people use straight line depreciation and in fact i believe if you don't state what it is it will um it'll the the government will assume that it's straight line depreciation um the thing that's been removed is the use allowance use allowances are no longer uh permitted they were permitted for um fully used up assets but no longer permitted Uh, buildings, you can actually break down if you are in the ownership of a building into the shell of the building, the, bus the building service systems like HVAC elevators or fixed equipment. Um, but again, uh, no depreciation on assets that fully um, outlive their lives or depreciable lives. Um, you must have adequate property records and physical inventories every two years. Employee health and welfare is generally allowable. Um, there were a lot of specific details like the use of uh, gyms and so forth uh, for health. Just because they were removed and the uniform guidance update did not mean that they were not allowable. If you don't see something that's specifically stated as unallowable or a very strong concept of an uh, that it would be unallowable, you can still assume it's allowable. Entertainment for any purpose is unallowable. The only exception is something where for programmatic specific purposes, you're working with students and those students, you wanna give them a little gift card for achievement and that would be allowable, but there should be strong controls. Equipment and other capital assets are very similar to the way GAP would be um, for the tangible assets, useful life greater than one year. Uh, you know, the acquisition cost um, and it's, it's lesser of either your internal policy or $5,000 is the max and there's special rules for special purpose equipment or research medical scientific in that if they are charged direct, they're part, they're actually government property and uh, therefore you must have permission and usually that permission comes from the budget. Exchange rates is another new cost principle, and it's a good idea because there are changes in um, exchange rates, even probably on a day-by-day -day basis. And those fluctuations, the government just wants you to know that, that they will accommodate it and fund it through your grant with reasonable um, fluctuations. If they're extreme and it impacts and impinges on the performance of the award, then you're gonna have to get approval to continue. Um, and uh, it should be based on local currency and some basic evaluator of the currency rates to U.S. rates. So OANDA OANDA um, is one popular currency uh, converter that's recognized. Please keep proper uh, documentation on that. As you probably know, and as Tricia would agree, document, document, document. If it's not in the file, then it's it's not a cost that they can support. Uh, obviously, exactly. <laughs> fines and penalties are unallowable unless you're pursuing, unless it's pursuant to an award, uh, like with another country or something like that. Fundraising is generally unallowable. Um, I've noticed with smaller entities, sometimes proposal costs are included with fundraising because the IRS talks about fundraising, their term of fundraising is fundraising plus uh, proposal cost. But for government um, purposes for recovery, the proposal costs are allowable. And so you may wanna try to separate it in some way through your series of accounts. Gains and losses on depreciable assets basically is uh, the difference between what's realized on property and the undepreciable basis of the property. Um, and obviously for government, for items that were purchased with government funds, then it must be um, disposed of based on a property trust relationship or arrangement. Goods and services for personal use is just that. It's for personal use. It's not allowable, even if it's uh, on a W-2. So it's something just to think about. 
Insurance generally is allowable. I know our time is short, so I'm trying to go through this thing as quick as I can. Um, the big thing there is uh, key person or key man insurance where the entity uh, receives is the beneficiary. And because the entity is the beneficiary, um, therefore uh, it's unallowable. Self-insurance with most nonprofits would be in the area of uh, health insurance that generally you have claims and then you have an administrator and you have stopgap insurance. The sum of all that should be equal to or less than the premium cost. If it's greater, it could be disallowed. Business interruption coverage is allowable. Um, you know, and you'd probably be thinking about that. Does, does that relate to COVID-19 if you had such a policy? And of course you would just, you have to check the policy to see if it's covered. Lobbying costs is not only unallowable, but it's something you certainly would not want to incur because it could get um, an investigation from the inspector general. So, you know, things like influencing, you know, federal or state officials, whether it be legislatively or an executive position, all are unallowable. But think of it this way, um, you know, anything where you're using publicity or what they call propaganda to influence the public by fundraising, letter writing, rally, telephone, promoting, any kind of promoting cause, all of that is considered lobbying. Sometimes entities call that policy. So we check the policy to see if indeed it is lobbying, which indeed is unallowable. There are exceptions on this page and on the next slide, um, and you can read them. The IRS uh, gives you some exceptions, as you can see on this slide. Okay. Um, losses on other awards or contracts. Basically, you cannot move money around creative accounting or move money to indirect to cover for losses. Maintenance and repair, the key there is, of course, maintenance and, and repair costs would be allowable, but not if you're prolonging um, uh, the useful life or the value of that asset or adding permanent value to the asset. Materials and supply costs, including computing devices. It's nice now that computing devices are considered supplies um, and are in, in included in this definition. Um, obviously, the government wants you to take any volume discounts or discounts that are awarded based on volume and quantity. Um, and uh, um, obviously, you would only put on a direct award if you have material items the actual amount, you know, I don't know how else you would do that. Obviously, federal donated materials, you would not be charging the government, but they are going to say it and they're going to say the obvious just because it's happened before. Membership subscriptions and professional activity costs generally are allowable. People who belong to the AICPAs um, and because they're certified public accountants, obviously all of that is allowable as part of your profession and also the trade magazines. Um, as well. It's just things like if you're a part of a social club or something would be unallowable. Organization costs. Organization costs are the costs if you were an association and you wanted to start a foundation. This has happened many, many times because then that becomes the fundraising unit for the related to an association. And that's perfectly fine, but the costs are completely unallowable. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, I think for sake of time, I'm not going to read off the question and the answers, um, but you have it up on your screen. So please take a moment to answer. And while everybody's submitting their answers, I'll provide the final CPE word. Our final CPE word is loss. Remember, if you want to receive CPE credit, you'll need this word for the survey that follows our webinar. Again, the final CPE word is loss, L-O-S-S. -S. Well, the correct answer is all of the above. Participant support costs are costs where you bring people together and they're trained and you're doing the hosting costs. It's not generally your employees, it's, it's other people that you're helping, but those costs to be allowable generally are charged, of course, direct and are in your budget. And as far as your indirect cost rate, it's removed from your allocation base. Plant and security costs are allowable. 
fire the guy that's sleeping. Pre-award costs are also allowable. It's like a letter contract. Generally, they're usually 90 days before the award. This is something to consider um, that you follow whatever costs they specifically permit. If they're giving you a, a letter contract, you will definitely want to make sure there's some costs associated with it too as well and stay within that period and within the specific level items of costs that they permitted you to charge to. Professional service costs, I think the bottom line there is it depends. They did say not one thing makes it allowable or unallowable. They give you a bunch of things to consider. But the four basic things that you must have in an agreement is the description, statement of work, performance period, billing rates, and termination clause. Proposals of costs, the bottom line to that is that it is allowable cost and is charged indirect. Again, separate that from fundraising if you're thinking in terms of the 990, this part is allowable. And it also applies to non-federal similar things like that you would put together proposals for foundation awards. So that can be helpful for you. Recruitment and relocation, the bottom line is if employees are leaving voluntarily within the first 12 months, those costs may be, they will be unallowable. And then rental costs, you know, again, you'll be doing a market analysis of that and trying to determine what is the best um, situation for, um, for, uh, for renting or leasing um, an office space. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, just remember that under the sales and leaseback, you're limited to the cost of ownership, and it's the same for less than arm's length transactions or related party transactions. Then we get into, as we know, that there are capital leases under ASC 840, but that will change. As uh, Tricia will tell you, that's been extended as far as when you come under that, but just remember that those assets will be a little bit different. They'll be called finance lease. Um, not capital leases anymore, and they will go on the balance sheet. Oh, the one other little thing at the bottom of there, but that's okay. Workspaces are not allowable. Um, leasing expenses for, for home workspaces are not allowable. As far as tax and VAT, the important thing there now is VAT is an allowable cost. And finally, with travel costs, travel costs, you can have something that's either per diem based, you can and follow the GSA per diems or establish your own per diems. Um, and it could be actual based or a combination thereof. But just be very wary or very careful that when you look at an award under the terms and conditions, specifically, um, if it's an old federal award, they may require no matter what that you follow the GSA per diems. So now we'll move to questions. Great. Thanks, Paul and Trisha as well. So before we wrap up, um, I think we have time for probably one question submitted um, by our online participants. And it looks like the question is, does the adjustment period for the PPE loan start on the date of the loan or the date of application? And follow on, can the use of the funds extend beyond June 30th? Thanks, Yev. I, I think that I can take that one. So as far as the adjustment period goes, again, that's for an eight-week period under the PPP loan. So whatever that eight-week period is, uh, I believe that it starts on April 1st. Um, you know, if you were going to be utilizing the PPP loan for um, your compensation for items that I guess you are federally charging for your compensation to uh, your grants, then that would be your period. Again, unanswered question, needing to really reach out to your awarding agency to really understand what the, the consequence may be here. Work with your auditors. Um, you know, I can tell you that we are still trying to understand what the consequences might be and the repercussions as this uh, relates to. As far as the use of the funds extending beyond June 30, I, I'm, um, again, I'm not really clear on, on where that guidance is, but I can tell you that we have a task force team here within GRF. So if you're interested in reaching out to them, um, Amy Bolin and Dick LaCastro are those two people who are in charge of that PPP loan and uh, program and understanding what all of the details are about it. Again, as I mentioned previously, on our website under resources, we have a COVID-19 um, industry alert page uh, and you can find additional information related to 
uh, all of the alerts and news that we're aware of at this point in time. And again, under our blog, we also have the uh, white paper under the OMB relief that was extended back on March 20th, 19th, sorry. Great, thanks, Shusha, that was very helpful. Um, and just a reminder, if anybody has any other additional questions, um, our contact information was on the previous slide, so feel free to reach out. And with that, we'd like to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. We encourage you all to follow us on social media at GRFCPAs and visit our website at www.grfcpa.com for all upcoming events and alerts. And one just final reminder, please remember to complete the survey that follows if you'd like to earn CPE credit for today. And thanks to everybody for attending and have a great day. Thank you all.